Welcome to the stories behind the songs with Dave Kittle. Back in 1979, Dave began a radio career at Shea 106 in Ottawa, which spanned 17 years. He was one of the on-air voices that I grew up listening to, and he introduced me to new music that literally changed my life. His knowledge and passion for music are inspiring, to say the least. And in this six-part podcast, Dave and I sit down and discuss the British invasion. Brian Epstein had discovered them around this time because I was believe it was in their second trip to Liverpool to Hamburg that they that they made a recording with Tony Sheridan, backing backing another this right. guy Tony Sheridan who was another yeah. English rocker based in Hamburg, uh, playing the same circuit that they were playing, who got a record deal and needed a backing band, so the Beatles backed them up as the Beat Brothers. Okay, yeah, and. Um, made their own record, a song called My Bonnie, which was released, which, uh, the st- so the story goes, this guy, this young kid, went into Brian Epstein's record shop. Brian Epstein was a, came from a very prominent Liverpool family uh, in the furniture business, and uh, he ran a record store called NEMS, North End Music Stores in Liverpool. And uh, this guy came in, this kid came in and wanted a... Uh, uh, my, by Bonnie, by the Beatles, uh, and he'd never heard of it before. And it was through his research into this song that he found out that these guys were from Liverpool and they were playing just down the street at the Cavern Club. Mm-hmm. And that's where he discovered them and became their manager. And then they went back to live to Hamburg again. I think they went four times, all told. Uh, but they were, they played, they played so much. They were, back in the, not only the um, the amount of time they played in Hamburg, but when they came back to Liverpool, they were playing every night. Yeah, they were playing twice a day. They do a, a lunchtime session. They play an evening session. They were playing all the time. So they were not only getting better musically, but they were also getting better um, as a foursome. They like everything was gelling. They were they were just more. I polished is the only word I can think yep. of. They, but they were still pretty raw back in those days. Yeah. Prior to Epstein discovering them, right. they were still on stage playing in in, in, in leather suits, um, smoking, drinking, joking with the audience on stage. Yeah. They had no set list. They just played what they wanted. Uh, they were pretty pretty rough. They were pretty rough. And Epstein cleaned them up. He, he knew that if they were going to make it, they had to have a much more polished stage presence. Okay, yeah. He put them in suits. He, uh, he made, them, made them stop uh, eating and drinking and smoking on stage and joking with the audience. Put together a set, a, a set list. Here's the songs that you play every night. And he just basically cleaned them up and made them much more professional. Right. They already had the hairstyles. The hairstyles came from... Uh, from Astrid Kirshner, actually, who okay. developed uh, their hairstyles in, in Germany. Uh, Stu Sutcliffe was actually the first one to uh, adopt the, so the, the the then Beatle haircut. Yeah. And Which is what? Just a bowl cut, really, when you pretty think much, about it, right? Yeah, pretty Put a much. a bowl on your head and Bangs, it. bangs, pushed yeah. forward. You yeah. know, back in those days, everybody slicked their hair back. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> they, that's right. Called it, they called it, <clears throat> excuse me, they called it a duck tail back in the day. Duck tail. A hairdo, and they they slicked all the hair the hair back, yeah, and and, yeah. and, and she she uh, got him to you know um, comb his hair forward in a in a a style that actually students in Paris had been had been wearing for a couple of years, okay, uh, and uh, they all eventually adopted it, but it was Stu Sutcliffe that first adopted the through Astrid Kirshner, his right. then girlfriend, um, but Epstein really cleaned them up. And by the time they uh, by the time they signed with George Martin and Parlophone, they were a pretty professional looking unit on stage. Yeah, you know they were they were wearing the, the they wore they wore suits on stage. They had a much more professional stage show because they were playing much better uh, venues at the time. They yeah. were they were starting to move out of the Cavern Club, the, the famous venue in Liverpool where they played. A lot, yeah, yeah, close to three hundred or so gigs over the years. But they were starting to play uh, theaters and ballrooms around the Liverpool and Manchester area, so they were starting to branch out, uh, to yeah. branch out and get bigger and better. They were, they were, they were learning their craft. They were being much more polished and professional. Yeah, 
And then, so by the time that we saw them in February of 64, uh, they had been a big deal in England for a year. So they were, they'd, they'd had a couple of number one hits in the UK. They yeah. were, they did a couple of big package tours. They did a package tour with Roy Orbison. They did a package tour with the Everly Brothers prior to them coming over here. Okay, okay. So they uh, they were pretty pretty slick. They were pretty professional by the time they hit uh, North America. So it's fascinating to think <clears throat> that you know by the time, like you said, by the time we see them, they're this you know finely honed instrument, really yeah. on stage, this this well oiled machine. But the years prior to that, like I mean, they paid their dues. They certainly did pay their dues. Like, they were certainly no overnight sensation. No, that's for sure. No, no. Yeah, like every day they would play every day, twice a day. Sometimes they do a lunchtime session, yeah, and then they'd they'd uh, they'd go off and do a show at night, yeah, and they play every day. That's that's phenomenal, phenomenal. Do you know yeah. of any other any other bands, any other artists in the world that are, that that you're aware of that put that much work? Well, the only I mean. other one I can think of were the <coughs> the Rolling Stones, who okay. followed closely in the wake of the Beatles. Uh, their their schedule was pretty intense in the in those days as well. They were playing every night, and and all over England, like the Beatles. The Beatles at first were were pretty well concentrated in the Liverpool area. Right, okay. Liverpool, Manchester. Yeah. Manchester is very close to Liverpool, That's but okay. all in that sort of area. The Stones were the same sort of thing, but the Stone they, they started to branch out and 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 travel a little bit more. Uh, yeah. So they would have to get in the van and travel to Newcastle or travel to Sheffield or travel to. You know, to do a gig and then back to London. So they were they were working a lot as well, wow. a lot, and and, and, and recording we, and writing and 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 they didn't have a lot of days off. Those bands back yeah. in the day, and 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 the longevity of these bands, I mean, is a testament to all the hard work. Oh yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, the Beatles <clears throat> are obviously not not together anymore. But you look at a guy like Paul McCartney, who's now what seventy seven and still going and strong. still going strong and still doing. You know, a couple of hundred dates a year. Well, maybe not that many, but a hundred, hundred and fifty dates yeah, a year. Yeah, uh, the Stones are still together. Yeah. They're, they've just announced uh, an, uh, they're going to they're going out uh, on the road in North America next year for thirteen dates so far. Okay, which will probably expand. Expand. Oh yeah, yeah. I would think um, so. You know, I mean, Keith Richards is what seventy seven now. Mick How? Jag Mick Jagger seventy seven now. What about Charlie Watts? Charlie Watts. Because he always looked. Older than everybody else, because he probably was he. Is he the oldest? No, actually. Well, he of of the of the remaining Rolling Stones, he is. But Bill Wyman, the original yeah. bass player of the Stones, is in his eighties now. Oh, okay. Because okay. Bill Wyman was, uh, I think, six or seven years older than the rest of the Rolling Stones. He was born in nineteen thirty six, I think. Okay. Bill Wyman. And uh, and Jagger and Richards were born in forty two. I think Charlie Watts was born in forty one. Oh, okay. Charlie's seventy eight now. Okay. Mick and Keith are seventy seven. Uh, Bill Wyman, I believe, was born in thirty five or thirty six. So he would be eight, in his early eighties now. Huh. Now Bill left the band a number of years ago. He doesn't doesn't play with them anymore. But of the original Rolling Stones, he would have been the oldest. What did he do his own thing, or did he retire from music? He re no, he did his own thing. He. Uh, he um, he was always afraid of flying, so he was not a very good flyer. And he had it he had it with the playing with the band uh, after all those years. And he uh, he started up a a, a, a little outfit uh, called Bill Wyman's Rhythm Kings. Okay, with a couple of other guys like Gary Wright of uh, Procol Harum. Okay, yeah, and uh, a couple of other old British rockers, and they just sort of they make an album every couple of years and do a little you know play around that just kind have of some thing. fun. Just have some fun, and they stay they stay pretty much local. They pretty don't much, they don't yeah, do much. anything. They wow, don't, they don't uh, they don't travel very often. They stay close to home. So the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. Uh, Obviously, uh, two major, major um, bands f of the so-called British Invasion, mm -hmm. right? Uh, who else was involved? I mean, there was there were a bunch of them, right? Like th they opened the door, then suddenly there's all kinds of bands, and some of them were copycat bands, right? Well, the the Kinks, the Yardbirds, yeah. uh, oh my God, the uh, the Zombies, the Animals, yeah. the Hollies. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Herman's Hermits, who were probably more popular than the Beatles and the Stones for a, a few years in the mid-60s. 
uh, although they were pre- pretty much of a lightweight, more of a pop band than a rock band. Well, I remember the song, Mrs. Brown, yeah. you've got a lovely daughter. Yeah. I'm Henry the Eighth. I oh, am. yes, 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 of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, so why were they, I'm sorry, why why were they, well, were they more popular just because they, they had more press or they were just... The, 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 the kids loved them. Okay. The young girls especially loved them because of the because of uh, Peter Noon. Yeah. The front man, Herman of Herman's Hermits, Peter Noon, yeah. was a, a, a very cute looking guy. You've been listening to the stories behind the songs with Dave Kittle. Join us again next week for the continuation of this podcast. Brought to you by Sunholes Music. Download the latest album now at sunholes.com.